So thanks for coming. Yesterday um, in the talk, Ryan invited us to explore the seeking phase and to really get clear on why we're practicing and what direction we want our practice to take us in. And having done that, we can use um, that clarity as a kind of inner compass um, to enable us to choose a practice path that is in alignment with what's most important to us. If we know what's most important to us, then we can make sure that our path is in alignment with that. And once we've found an approach to practice that calls to us in this very deep way, um, we can commit to that approach with dedicated practice. And when we do that, then we enter the, the next phase of insight, which is the effort phase, moving from seeking to effort. And here we get clear on what there is to be done, what the work actually is, and how we go about doing that work. And then being clear on what there is to be done and how to do it, we just do it. We just do it, no excuses. And so at this stage, it's like we sort of stop shopping in the spiritual department store, you know, trying on this practice and that practice and seeing which one fits and which one looks good on us. And we just make the damn purchase. We take it home and we commit with effort. But having um, spent that good time that Ryan mentioned in the seeking phase to correctly set our internal compass point in the direction of our highest values, it shouldn't be too hard to find motivation to practice. It shouldn't be that hard to show up and take the steps that are needed to move in the direction of our highest intentions. And if you're lucky, the practice path can even seem to draw you along it. Sometimes though, um, we do need to employ some psychological strategies in order to boost our motivation. I mean, who doesn't like a nice star chart, right? Checking off sequential days of practice on the wall calendar or, you know, building up milestones on our Insight Timer app, which we can, you know, show on our, on our profile. Um, you can do these kinds of things to sort of dangle a carrot for your practice, for yourself, a reward for practicing. And then sometimes motivation needs a stick to move you along on the, on the practice path. And um, when Will and I were dating transatlantically way back in 2007, um, we started up our meditation practice in earnest on separate continents. So he was in San Francisco and I was in London. And um, we would check in with each other how we were doing with our practice in one of a vast quantity of innumerable phone calls. We didn't just talk about practice, of course. It was very romantic. Um, but um, the deal was that if one of us hadn't been practicing, that the other one could boast about their virtuous commitment and call the other one a loser. So this was just our sort of um, humorous way of calling each other out. And you know, we also wanted to impress each other. We were in the audition phase of our, of our relationship. Um, and so we had the carrot of this um, shared interest in this um, practice that we were um, felt very deeply connected with. Um, and we had the stick of not wanting to be a loser. So that worked very well for motivational purposes. And when engaging with the effort phase or with effort in practice in general, it can be very useful to know what your particular kind of relationship to effort is. Um, on the front of the Greek 
temple of Apollo in Delphi was written, know thyself. And in the classical yoga tradition, Svadhyaya or self-study is the second rung in the practice, the eight-legged practice. It's one of the niyamas. And so knowing yourself, knowing how you interact with your experience helps you optimize your interaction with your experience. Knowing your relationship to effort is important because how we do anything is how we do everything. And so if you're an over-efforter in life, then it's likely that you'll bring that same attitude and energy to the meditation cushion. And same if you're an under-efforter. Although it tends to be that not many under-efforters end up practicing meditation in a, seri in a serious way. It's sort of a self-selective self process in a way. But here we are on a, on a practice path of gradual awakening um, that's sometimes called the progress of insight. And we're on a path and there's definitely progress to be made. And practice is meant to be developmental and not just recreational. And there are signposts along the path and things that are called attainments. And it sort of feels a bit maybe like there are levels, like it's a video game. You know, there's something to be achieved. There's somewhere to go. And this can stir up our strive drive. And we can end up frowning our way through our practice, you know, hunching our shoulders and furrowing our brows and, you know, giving ourselves headaches and neck ache. We can be grasping after altered state experiences. You know, if we've had a really good concentration set and we've had some kind of bliss experience or we feel like we've reached a certain stage, that can bring up a lot of strive, a lot of grasping. And then we can get frustrated when we feel periods of practice where we don't feel like we're getting anywhere or like we're even backsliding, like we're slipping backwards. And so our, in our strive for progress and attainment, we can start to become so entangled in our self-judgment about that, about where we are and our frustration with our lack of progress that then that in itself starts to become a hindrance to our progress in practice. So it's kind of like a, like a knot, like a mess. So I've already identified myself as a recovering perfectionist way back at the start of the retreat, you might remember. And if you also are an overzealous overachiever, a uh, type A person, uh, a pitta dosha in Ayurveda or a, a liver type person in Chinese medicine. Um, basically, if you know that you're usually just trying too hard, then you might need to turn that shit down a notch or two and just balance all that effort, all that struggle, all that striving with a bit of letting go, a bit of softening a bit of a lying, a bit of easing off the gas pedal. Dare I say, even a bit of surrender. Or you might be one of those people at the other end of the spectrum of effort and struggle with motivation, find it hard to get on the cushion, or just find yourself bored or feeling dull or sleepy in sitting practice. And you might just need to find some creative combinations of the kinds of carrots and sticks that work for you so that you can light a fire under your own ass or on top of your head so that you can practice like your hair is on fire so that you can move efficiently through this phase of insight, the effort phase. 
And there's no judgment here. We're all somewhere on this natural spectrum of orientation towards effort. And it's partly just the genetic hand that we've been dealt. Uh, neurotransmitters like dopamine and acetylcholine and norepinephrine regulate things like attention and motivation and wakefulness. And the hormones cortisol and adrenaline set up our nervous system to be more towards the sympathetic fight flight hypervigilant hyperactive end of the spectrum or the parasympathetic chilled out relaxed end we're all just somewhere on that spectrum just by accident of genetics and then there's the whole um, question of our conditioning and the conditioning that comes from our upbringing and I like to blame a lot of my strive drive on the fact that I spent a lot of time in my childhood as a competitive trampolinist. So trampolining, <laughs> like gymnastics, um, same kind of things, just done on a trampoline rather than on the floor. And in trampolining and gymnastics, every move that you make is marked by its deviation away from perfection. So for every move in every routine, you have a theoretical maximum score of one point. And for every perceived flaw and deviation that you, that you make in the shape of the move, away from that, you lose fractions of a point. So you're marked by increments away from perfection. And you know what's what does that do on a develop on a developing mind? And it's the same for um, sporting achievement. It's the same for academic achievement, musical achievement. All of these things, these personality drivers, like try hard, hurry up, be perfect. They're all set in our neural architecture very early in our lives are wired into our brains from a very young age. And then not to mention the cultural context in which all of this operates. You know, modern life in general tends to reward achievement and effort. You know, it's all busyness, go, 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 and it's resulting stress. It's a, it's a modern, um, malady, and it was really clear to me when I moved, even from the UK to the USA, um, that the the Puritan roots of um, American culture um, take the Protestant work ethic to extremes. You know, of the twenty one richest countries in the world, the USA is the only one that does not legally mandate employers to provide paid time off for its workers. So, you know, if you're in the UK, you might get four or six weeks paid time, time off. If you're in France, you might get maybe two, two months. You know, this, the culture here is really one of, you know, give it, all, give it all you've got, no pain, no gain. You know, busyness in a way is next to godliness in this, in this culture. And maybe one of the strange gifts of the, the time that we've just had, the great sort of pause around the pandemic, um, is that we sort of got a glimpse, even if it was an enforced glimpse, of a different way of being. Something slower and, yeah, just something where the, the glorification of busyness just was forced to stop for a while. So Rick Hansen talks about meditation as being a process of self-directed neuroplasticity. By practicing smartly, we can start to overcome our automatic and often unconscious tendencies 
and start to undo the influences from nature and genetics, from nurture and from culture on our very neural wiring. He describes it as using the mind to change the brain, to change the mind for the better. The mind is like a self-upgrading computer. The software that we run on the hardware actually sculpts it and, and updates it. So if you have a mind that is prone to over-efforting, then and the, a brain that has wired to run over effort well, then in order to change that, you have to start to spin the mind down and run at a little, run the software at a little slower speed, run programs of more relaxation and more ease. And over time, those neurons fire together and wire together, and we start to create new neural architecture. And I also want to quickly touch on the fact that um, there can seem to be a bit of distaste for effort, even in some spiritual circles or some practices. Um, you can sort of get the message that it's not spiritual to be making effort. Um, you know, we hear things like, we're all already enlightened and there's nothing to go and not, nowhere to go and nothing to do. And um, on a very deep level, that's true. And yet, it's kind of a both and situation. So paraphrasing um, Suzuki Roshi, he said, we're all perfect just as we are, and we could all use a little work. And even the historical Buddha's final words on his deathbed reportedly were, now monks, I exhort you, all compounded things are subject to decay. Strive on with earnestness. Sounds like a vote for effort, me. In fact, right effort is uh, the sixth part of the Buddha's eightfold path of awakening. And right effort along with right mindfulness and right concentration make up the part of the path that relates to mental discipline. The Buddha said, and what is right effort? One generates the desire to prevent the arising of unskillful states not yet arisen, the desire to give up unskillful states already arisen, the desire to develop skillful states not yet arisen, and the desire to nurture and further develop skillful states already arisen. One makes an effort exerts energy, focuses and directs the mind to these ends. So that's, that's the OG himself, <laughs> giving the thumbs up to effort. So if we do study and get to know ourselves through our practice, we can start to catch ourselves when we fall into um, habitual patterns that are unskillful, that aren't helpful in getting us where we want to go on our path. And then we can begin to learn and to apply the appropriate antidote at the appropriate time. So here we're using metacognitive awareness, and this is the ability of the mind to watch the mind. And we're cultivating uh, this metacognitive awareness through our practice of mindfulness. We're watching our minds with our minds. And using this metacognitive awareness, we can discern as we're practicing, what do I need to apply in this moment? Do I need more effort or do I need more relaxation? More gas? 
or more breaks. When effort and relaxation are balanced, they support the development of concentration and mindfulness. So with this in mind, rather than thinking that in order to be able to be better, better <laughs> at sustaining our attention on the breath and on the body sensations, we just need to we think that we just need to apply more strenuous effort if we feel like we're not good at it. I instead invite you to explore what right effort looks like for you. And kind of like when we're developing um, an exercise routine, a routine in the gym, um, right effort is not overstraining and it's not under efforting. It's a middle way. And so one of the traditional descriptions of this process is that it's compared to the, the tuning of the vena. And the vena is a stringed instrument. It's a bit like a sitar. And so if the strings on the vena are too loose, they don't make a sound. And if they're too tight, then they break. But if the strings of the vena are perfectly tuned, then it's able to make a beautiful sound. And just in the same way, where they're, when tuned not too tight and not too loose, then the concentrated mind is a beautiful instrument of mindfulness. So in your practice today, I invite you to check out how much effort is involved. If you find yourself overstraining, try leaning out. Zooming out, savoring the practice a little bit, letting experience come to you. After all, it's just sitting. And if you find yourself feeling dull and blunted, then try leaning in, try zooming in, try tightening up a bit, try probing more actively into experience. After all, this is a matter of the development of your mind. So how do we find this balance in real time while we're practicing this, pra this balance between effort and relaxation? Well, we can use our interoception. An interoception is the sense our own sense of what's going on, the internal state of the body. And so with our interoceptive awareness, we scan the body to look for the sensations that are there. And if we're over-efforting, there are some pretty telltale sensations. And let's do this right now. Close your eyes. And just become mindfully aware of body sensations. And just allowing attention to scan through the body. And as you do, notice, are you forcing the breath? in some way or holding the breath. Is there any excessive tension in the body? What's going on in the shoulders, in the hands? in the butt cheeks. What's happening in your forehead and your jaw? As a yoga teacher of mine once said, if your face 
would scare a baby, you're probably trying too hard. So release the tension. Roll the shoulders up to the ears. Give them a squeeze. <sighs> Breathing in. And then exhale, maybe sighing out loud. <sighs> Let it go. And just notice, how does that feel? You can open your eyes again if you like. Too little effort. And you might feel spacey or dull or sleepy. And if so, brighten the mind by opening the eyes. With eyes closed, that's normally a signal for our body that we're supposed to be going to sleep. So it can be um, hard to uh, spend a lot of time during the day when we should be getting daylight into our eyes with our eyes closed. So you can try to practice with open eyes. And in some traditions, that's the standard. Or if that's too distracting, with eyes closed, you can imagine a bright blue sky with sun in it. Just imagine brightening the mind in that way. You can also emphasize the in-breath. To relax, we emphasize the out-breath by sighing. You can emphasize the in-breath. Take some bigger, deeper breaths. You can speed up the breath. You can sit up a little bit taller in your seat. You can stand up. You can walk around, sit back down again, or switch completely to standing or moving practice. All of these will help the mind to brighten and increase uh, the, your availability for concentration and mindfulness. So if we want to change our minds or change our communities, or change the world, then effort will surely be required. No doubt about that.